Welcome to Tales from the Jar Side, the video series. If you're not interested in reading my newsletter or you don't have time or you're just behind on them, that's okay. I'll read it to you, along with other stories and other information. My name is Ken Cousin and I'm your host. I'm actually recording this in Bangalore in India. Here's actually for those who are not aware. This is uh, Google Maps opened up. You can see India here and when I zoom in a bunch, you'll see there's Bengaluru, as they say, and this is the site of the Great International Developer Conference, which I refer to in the newsletter. Let's get started. So, welcome fellow Jarheads to Tales from the Jar Side, the Cousin IT newsletter for the week of April 16th through 23rd, now 24th, 2023. This week I taught the third week of my Android Developer Boot Camp and my Reactive Spring and Spring Boot course, both on the O'Reilly Learning Platform. And I also taught a deep dive into Spring course as a no-fluff, just-stuff virtual workshop. Regular readers of, and listeners to, and of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as Jarheads, and are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. I hope I run into some at the conference this week. If you wish to become a Jarhead, please subscribe using the button on the newsletter, or even better, the button on the YouTube channel. I start off this week by talking about a technical thing that I published. This was a YouTube video on the differences between the Makito class and the BDD Makito class. It's one of those odd situations where you have two classes that basically have pretty much the same API with only slight differences, and the reason for the difference is partly historical and partly that the creators of Makito decided they wanted to support the effort toward behavior-driven design. At any rate, there's a nice little video about it, and I published an article on Medium, or rather, Pragmatic Programmers in their publication included my article. So that's there if you're interested, and you're welcome to take a look. Uh, as I say, I promise, now that I know what that face looks like, <laughs> I'll never make that face again if I can avoid it. Let's move on. Incidentally, I say after hovering at 199 subscribers on my YouTube channel for a few days, the total jumped to 201 this morning. I checked again this morning. I know I shouldn't do that, but I knew I was making this recording. I'm up to 207 now. Yay. Uh, this is currently week 16 of 2023, and I started the channel at the beginning of the year, so I did the math. And it turns out that's roughly 12 and a half new subscribers every week. And at that rate, I'll make it to the 1000 minimum level needed for monetization in late June of 2024. So let's keep up the good work. Unfortunately for monetization, you also need 4000 watch hours within the previous year, whatever that turns out to be. And I only have 158 watch hours. A lot of my videos are very short. So we'll see how that plays out. I didn't want to work out that number. That would be depressing. Maybe I'll record something that'll go viral. Maybe it'll be this newsletter. It, stranger things have happened, although not recently. I should note that while reaching those numbers is a goal, I do have that as a goal. I, I don't do this for the monetization. Heck, I don't even charge for the newsletter. My real goals are that I'm enjoying the recording and editing process. I use this tool called ScreenFlow, which is mostly a screen capture tool. And I'm really enjoying learning that. And it's a very useful skill for what I do. So that's good. It also gives me an excuse to communicate with my unofficial official social media consultant, which is my son, you know, or who is my son, at any rate. And of course, this helps me with my bizarre, unusual ideas, reach a broader audience, a bigger audience. And maybe you'll give me feedback about that. None of those actually requires monetization, obviously. But getting a bigger audience will help and eventually may get me noticed enough to join Nebula. And I love Nebula. If you haven't seen Nebula, uh, that looks like this. This is Nebula.tv. In reality, uh, just a warning, I'm on a hotel Wi-Fi at the moment. So things are correspondingly a little bit slower. And you see there is just a whole list of videos that are there. But it's a, it's a creator-owned site. And... There are no ads or anything like that. There's also no comments, interestingly enough, but it's really wonderful. And I spend more time there than I do on any other site. I really like that one, but I'm far too small for them to notice me yet. You know, someday we'll see. 
Okay, speaking of silly videos, I did something else this week, which I'm not sure why I felt obligated to tell everybody about, but hey, what the heck. I mentioned last week I'm going to be a visiting assistant professor in the computer science department at Trinity College in Hartford this fall. And it turned out that the deadline for submitting textbook requirements was this week, believe it or not, when I'm in India. And therefore, I decided I'm going to go ahead and put my values in anyway. And I wasn't sure what to pick, but the, the course I'm teaching is essentially an object-oriented programming course, which I'm going to enhance to make functional programming as well. And they prefer that I teach it in Java, which of course works for me. So I picked a couple of good books. I'm going to use the um, uh, Kathy Sierra and Bert Bates and now Tricia G version of Head First Java. And I'm also looking at one of Kay Horseman's Core Java books, but this one is the Core Java for the Impatient. So it's only one volume. I'll be going with that. And of course, it occurred to me after I'd already selected them that, geez, I have a book on this stuff, you know? I mean, here's my book is the Modern Java Recipes book for what it's worth. And it's not exactly a beginner book. It's more like if you already know Java and you want to upgrade to streams, lambdas, method references, all the functional features, then might as well, you know, have that here. It's taking a moment to come up, but I'll just add the image to the, uh, to the video. So let's not wait for that. And the problem was, it felt like an ethical dilemma to add that book to require it for the students. Cause I don't know. I mean, I, when I was a student for many, many years, I had lots of professors who'd require their own book. Frankly, that was one of the benefits of writing your own book. And some of those books were really good and some were just awful. And the only reason they would get bought at all is because the professor required them. At least that's my opinion. So I was really reluctant and I went back and forth on it and I finally decided, okay, fine, I'll put it in the re recommended list and I can tell everybody they don't actually have to buy it. And when I went to add it to the recommended list, as you'll see in the video, it wasn't available. They couldn't find it. They'd never heard of it. <laughs> they knew about my Making Java Groovy book, which is interesting. And they knew about the most recent one, the Makito Made Clear book, but they didn't know my Java books at all, even though same publisher as some of the others that they did know about. Oh, well, it was a mild lesson in humility and I made a video about it. So you're welcome to take a look. As I say here, I added lots of pictures and got to get those views and watch hours somehow, right? So it's up to you if you're interested. Okay, that brings me to the conference this week. It's known as GIDS, which used to be called the Great Indian Developer Summit and is now rebranded as the Great International Developer Summit. Conveniently keeping the same initials, they were in the process of expanding when the pandemic hit. And now, of course, it's back to just one one site and we'll see if that grows again the conference is held in bangalore I've, I, I make it sound like i've been here for years but i've only this is only my second trip here only my second time appearing but i did do one of the virtual conferences they did during the pandemic kids i gotta say is one of the best organized and run conferences i've ever attended uh, Dilip um, Thomas and his team at Salt March Media do a wonderful job. It's a pleasure to do business with them, seriously. So the time difference when I was speaking virtually was a little awkward because India, as many of you are no doubt aware, is UTC plus 530. They're on the half hour. And in Connecticut, I'm either on UTC minus four or minus five, depending on whether we're on daylight saving time. Right now, we are on daylight saving time. It's always weird because, I mean, it's summertime. It's not exactly like we need to save daylight, but okay. And I believe that puts us on UTC minus four, giving us a nine and a half hour time difference. The interesting question is whether my wife will give me a call sometime this week and get me at four in the morning or something. We'll see. The biggest challenge for me, of course, was travel because it's a long, long way to get there. In order to avoid making more than one stop. I wound up flying out of Boston and just getting to Boston was no picnic. I mentioned that I was going to drive to Framingham and take the so-called Logan Express bus. I don't know that anybody's interested in these details, but I wound up with some complicating factors. That Sumner Tunnel under maintenance closed for repairs on the weekend. Of course, I'm flying on the weekend. That turned out not to be an issue at all because the Sumner Tunnel is the one that goes north of Boston, not east and west. 
But due to school vacation weeks, parking at the Logan Express sites, especially the one in Framingham, is very limited. They tell you to take a take a ride sharing system like Uber. I actually wound up taking the Uber all the way into Logan Airport, which is kind of crazy, but it was very comfortable and got there without a problem. The flights were very good, had no issues with those. I did spend over an hour and a half in immigration. That just, the lines were really, really long for that. But I'm here. It's good. I'm just trying to recover from the jet lag. Let's move on. Okay. Oh, and for the record, if you've ever driven in India at all, you know that it's just a whole different world. And I've driven in Boston. I mean, I've driven in New York City. I, I know crazy in general, but nothing compares to driving in, in India that I've seen. And it's like lane lines. Why do they even bother? Why even paint the lines? I mean, nobody cares. And the horn is used for echolocation, not to mention telling everybody that you're about to cut them off. It's amazing. I'm not driving here, especially because they drive on the opposite side of the road, the one I'm used to. But I would be, a, I'd be terrified. And frankly, it's hard enough just to ride <laughs> without rising panic or, you know, keeping my eyes closed or worrying about nausea from the darting in and out. At any rate, I'm not, I'm not completely insane. I'm not going to drive. Depending on how I recover from the travel, I hope to record a short video each day reviewing the talks I attended and or presented. We'll see. We'll see how much the, that goes. Okay, now the next section, I talked about the continuing world championship of chess between Jan Nipponishi and Ding Loren going on in Kazakhstan. The updated score table looks like this, and games 7, 8, and 9 were played this week, which was a win for Nipo and a pair of draws. The game yesterday was also a hard-fought draw. So we are currently sitting at the, the score of 5.5 to 4.5 in favor of Nepo, with one, two, three, four games to go, one later today. I mean, now that I'm in India. So today, actually yesterday was a rest day. No, uh, Saturday was a rest day. And then the games this week were Sunday, which I already happened, and Monday, which will happen later. Then there's an off day, then Wednesday, Thursday, then there's an off day. And then Saturdays, the game, round 14 if necessary. And if they need tie breaks, that'll all happen on Sunday as well. At which point, hopefully I'll be home. We'll see how that goes. So far, it's been an extremely entertaining match, even though the best player in the world is not there. Maybe that's making it better because these two players are extremely well matched. They're very, very close. Reminds me a lot of the classic Karpov-Kasparov matches back in the 80s. So there's a linked Wikipedia page for details. Moving on, last week I talked about the fiasco that was Substack Notes, or at least the announcement of it, and how the CEO, Chris Best, went on a podcast interview and totally fumbled a question about content moderation. It was simply a disaster. So on Notes, of course, there was a follow-up by Hamish McKenzie, who wrote under saying his own byline, but you could consider an official company statement. And it's all the stuff you'd expect. Yes, we hate racism or bias of any kind. And this is terrible, but we're still not doing any real content moderation. We're certainly not going to promise to be successful at it. Uh, after all, we need the clicks to make money, although he didn't say that. So at any rate, I put the link in there if you're interested in seeing the overall statement. I'm not going to debate it here. But since I did bring it up, I figured I might as well post the follow-up as well. Uh, ha Hamish McKenzie is listed as co-founder of Substack and, and this is the part that gets me, chief writing officer, whatever that means. That's quite a title. I mean, there's a lot of title. I mean, you know, titles don't really mean anything. That I was once, I took a job where I was seduced by a title. I was vice president, general manager of uh, my little division and everything. And it sounded great to be VP level and general manager and all of that. And it's basically a sales manager for about three and a half months before the company went under, which I'd like to believe didn't have anything to do with me because I wasn't there that long. <laughs> oh, well. So moving on. Rapid unscheduled disassemblies. What a euphemism. So this week, SpaceX launched its Starship rocket for the first time which is like 30-some individual rockets all tied together, having twice the thrust of the old Saturn Vs, which took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. And it didn't work out well. Now, uh, the, the, the most bizarre part is how the company and the media echoed 
that this was such a success just because they got off the launch pad. I mean, really, is the bar really that low? If NASA had had the problems that SpaceX had, their funding would be cut for a decade. At any rate, it made it off the launch pad, and when it was supposed to reach the first stage separation, you can watch in the little included video how it starts rotating, but then keeps rotating, and rather than separate, the whole rocket exploded. Now, I've st since seen information saying that distributed a cloud of debris over Texas, and I put out a, a shared a free article from the New York Times that's going to take a long time to clean up, not the article, the debris, and tons of damage to the launch pad. That one I found an article about here, SpaceX's Starship launch was like a bomb destroying the launch pad, just left a crater behind. And social media is claiming that they were supposed to build a much better system for the launch pad to, with vents and cooling and everything, and Elon overrode it. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it really did destroy everything. And they'd only been given permission to launch once. So even though Elon says, oh, yeah, it was a success and we're going to try again in a couple of months. Yeah, OK, we'll see. We now know what Elon's promises are worth. The more he is not involved, the greater the likelihood there will be success. I mean. Who knew? At any rate, there's a picture of the explosion. So the entertaining part, however, is that we can, if we can use the word entertaining in a disaster, is that rather than say the rocket exploded, the officials referred to a rapid, unscheduled disassembly, which of course triggered a bunch of memes. This was a Hindenburg one. Oh, the rapid, unscheduled disassembly, right? Here's the Death Star blowing up. The Death Star experienced a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. This is the Titanic going down. I added the caption. Actually, it's hard to see this, but it basically says that as if the flight test was, this is the tweet from SpaceX, as if the flight test was not exciting enough. Oh my goodness. Starship experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly before stage separation. I'm like, seriously? 15 million views on that thing. Oh my goodness. So at any rate, because of the Titanic, I added something I've, wondered about for years. At first, she doesn't make room for Jack on that board. I mean, I, I've seen people say that both two people on that board would have caused it to sink. Which, okay, but they could have taken turns, right? She didn't even do that. And then at the end of the movie, after hanging on to that jewel for the, for the whole whatever 80 years, you know, that, that she held on to it, you know, 70, 80 years, she just tosses it into the ocean. <laughs> I mean, what the good she could have done with that if she just sold it. I mean, maybe Rose really was the real villain all along. And that rich jerk that she was, that she stood up, maybe he got off better that way. I don't know. At any rate, there's uh, this one from The Simpsons saying, uh, here, you know, Elon Musk being protected by the Musk stand saying it was a beautiful success. And the shooter saying, bro, your rocket exploded, which it did. Again, if this had happened to NASA, there'd be congressional hearings and funding cuts and everything. It would have been a mess. Finally, this thoughts of dog. Well, not finally, but almost there. I do not destroy my toys. They simply experience a rapid unscheduled disassembly. This has nothing to do with me. And that could be Elon. At any rate. And of course, my favorite, and I, I wore my, my Super Bowl 51 t-shirt in its honor was when Atlanta was leading New England in the in Super Bowl 51, 28 to 3 with two, two minutes and 12 seconds left in the third quarter. And in Tom Brady's finest hour, they managed to come all the way back and win in overtime. Amazing. It almost, but not quite, made up for botching the perfect season in 2007. I'm still mad about that, but Okay, this, this was one they never should have had, and they got it. So, okay, they, they lost two to the Giants that should have won. They won this one and the one against Seattle that they should have lost. So I guess it all works out. Moving on to the tweets and toots. Goodbye, blue checks. We hardly knew you. This week, 420 to be specific, of course, Elon finally got around to removing the blue checks from verified users if they had not subscribed to Twitter Blue. And according to the statistics from an independent count, before the purge, only 19,469 of the 407,000 legacy verified accounts that had been identified in April had Twitter Blue. And after the purge, 
that number that actually had Twitter Blue went up to 19,497 for a net increase of 28 accounts. Now, since then, there's been more chaos. He's gone in and started awarding blue checks to anybody who has a million followers or more, whether they want it or not. And this includes like Chadwick Boseman and other people who are deceased, you know, and have no say in this. Now, this is actually a legal issue because that's an implied endorsement that they don't agree with. This, I know this happened because Stephen King and, as I even mentioned here, I think I mentioned it, Stephen King and LeBron James both pointed out that they didn't want the blue check and they were not going to pay for this, and he gave it to them anyway. I think he's trying to make it look like it's still something worth having when it's a disaster. Uh, the nice little tweet here from Joe Abercrombie said, I sort of understand why you might pay to get into the VIP room Beyonce's in, but once Beyonce's kicked out, why would you pay to get into the room that's just full of people who paid to get into the room? And I get that, you know, this is not going to end well. Uh, I like this tweet, however. This actually, I think, was supposed to toot on Mastodon. It said, if you're writing about the death of Twitter, you have my permission to title your piece From Dawn to Musk. <laughs> That's that's clever. I like that one. This one, I, I didn't put in any context, but I thought this was very clever. It says, any headline? And this was a, from a, an image that was posted in a tweet, and it said, Betteridge's Law of Headlines, if this is from Wikipedia, is an adage that says, any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. So it's like, is this the end of Twitter? And the answer is no. You know, but whatever it names, whatever it happens to be, I'd never heard that. I think that's very clever. I'm going to keep an eye out and see if that actually shows up in practice in anything I'm working with. Next one, my wife cracked up at this one, automation issues. So this is the picture of a Ouija board with the meme saying, looks great until the Roomba accidentally summons a demon. Yeah, I could see how that might be a problem. Right. Under good assistance are hard to find. I, I included this comic by Hillary Price. It says a cat saying Susan's in the bathroom, but I sat on her lap for all the previous meetings. So yes, I'm familiar with the Ferguson account. So yeah, I'm not sure I'd trust any decisions that come out of that meeting, but yeah, okay, I could see that. And the final word was this little image I saw posted. It said me and it had the little animal here. And then me when the crushing realization of existence sets in. And then finally, me again, when the toaster dings with my Pop-Tarts. Oh, when I was younger, the frosted brown sugar cinnamon Pop-Tarts that right now would send my blood sugar th level through the roof. But boy, were they good for a while. Okay. Have a great week, everybody. As a reminder, you can see all my upcoming training courses on the O'Reilly Learning Platform at the link provided. And here's a link to the upcoming No Fluff, Just Stuff virtual workshops. This week, I did the reactive spring and spring boot course on O'Reilly, which was fun, although it's always too full. I did the third week of the Android development boot camp where we tried to do, tried to get into Jetpack Compose, but I'm going to have to revise that. I've been working through the, the tutorial on Jetpack Compose that's on the developer.android.com site. And that's, it starts off very slow, but it's, it's good stuff. And I, I am getting through it. It's just taking longer than I was hoping. And I did my deep dive into spring and spring boot. This week, of course, I'm at Gids. Now, I actually have six talks this week, one on Tuesday, two on Wednesday, one on Thursday, two on Friday. It's interesting that if you look at the Gids conference website, you find out that the keynote address every day is given by a current or former No Fluff Just Stuff speaker, as it turns out. Venkat Subramanian, of course, is going tomorrow to lead off the whole conference. And then Michael Carducci is doing Wednesday, and Mark Richards is Thursday, and Neil Ford is doing Friday. And they all have multiple talks. I have six. I think Mark Richards has seven. Michael Carducci has six as well, I think, maybe seven. And, of course, Venkat has 14 because it's Venkat, obviously. At any rate, have a good week, everybody, and thank you for listening. And I'll post at least something this week, whether I get to those daily summaries or not. We'll see. And take care. Good luck.